that said to me that perhaps my consciousness isn't just in my brain, but that it, it is imbued with more quality than that. And then as I was facing a very serious outcome, they talked about the possibility of having to amputate part of my leg. I remember laying with a cast from my hip down to my ankle and thinking about how to rally my immune system through my thoughts such that I could promote healing in my leg. And so I would lay on the couch and I would visualize my immune system and I could feel it tingling. I could feel the healing happening in my leg. And I didn't come from a medical family. I have no idea at all where this idea came from. But somehow it was noetic. It came directly to me that that was what I needed to do. And ultimately they took the cast off and I'm, you know, I'm a, a two-legged creature still, thank goodness. And so I think that there was something about, you know, my own personal experience with that, that healing. Um, that there was something about recognizing that my mind was important to my body and my body was important to my mind that that I just knew intuitively mind intention belief can these factors influence healing if you think you have an incurable disease if you think it yourself you are right if you think your problem is curable then you are also right it all depends on your intention when you think about intention, what is intention? And how does intention play a role in healing? Uh, intention plays a role when you think about how our thoughts and our emotions and our cognitions influence our immune system and our endocrine system. And we know that this happens. We know that people who feel a tremendous amount of stress, for example, have a, a, a diminished capacity in terms of their immune system's functioning. It's been discovered in the laboratory over the last 15 or 20 years, for example, that intention does have physical effects. So, for example, we recently conducted a study where we recruited couples, one of whom had cancer. And we took the partner of the cancer patient and we trained them in what we call the Compassionate Intention Program. And so they were invited in to uh, participate in a training program. A lot of it had to do with meditation. It had to do with heart opening. Uh, it had to do with subtle energies. And we took them through this training program, and then we asked them to go home and continue to practice this intervention for eight weeks. We brought them back, and we put them in our laboratory. And we monitored the patient in one room and we put them in a 2,000 pound electromagnetically shielded room so that there was no possibility of electromagnetic fields or the partner of the cancer patient talking to them on their radio, on their cell phone and saying, okay, breathe deeply now. We could rule out any of those kind of conventional explanations. Meanwhile, the partner who'd gone through the training program sat in another room and watched the image of their loved one on a closed circuit television screen. And then at random times throughout the session, they were asked to send loving, compassionate intention to the patient. The idea was to see if we could find correlations between the intention of the one person and the physiological activity of the other. What we found is that there was a significant correlation in the physiological activity of this person and the physiological activity of the other. This suggests that there is some way in which information is transferred that isn't uh, accountable by the conventional Newtonian model of cause and effect. You know, the partner of the cancer patient wasn't coming in and whispering in their partner's ear, calm down now. You know, quite the contrary. They were at a distance and there was no way that the two people knew when this kind of interaction was happening, and yet it happened. Sending an intention that I am better, sending information with belief that I am better, is sending information to the body to correct itself. Because as we say, a thought is an actual physical energy too, and it it sends information to the body as well. It's been very well demonstrated that our belief system affects how we behave and how we perform. And it also affects our lifestyle. So if we don't believe that we can help ourselves, we probably cannot. If we don't believe that 
positive information is useful to our health and well-being, then it probably won't be. Our thoughts create our body moment by moment. When we think positive thoughts, we release certain chemicals into our body. When we think negative thoughts, we release negative chemicals into our body. And those have a profound effect on how the cells are behaving and how the nutrition is being used. It's very obvious to me, working as an osteopath, that um, the stress that people hold in their body has various patterns according to how they're thinking. Probably the most essential aspect of healing is to, f to believe in the modality you're using and to stay positive in some way. There's so much evidence about belief in a system of medicine being crucial to the effectiveness of that. I used to say to people who have cancer, after researching the limitations of things like chemotherapy, don't have chemotherapy, it only works 9% of the time. I don't do that anymore. And the reason I don't is that I believe that belief itself is the body's strongest medicine. And if you believe something is going to work, regardless of what that is, it's going to work for you. There was a study in Houston of some patients going through a knee operation for arthritis. Half actually went through an operation where they were worked on for their arthritis. The other half were given a sham operation where they just opened the knee and then closed it and did nothing. They found over three years of follow-up that both sets of patients reported having no pain. So the patients where nothing was done to them still reported being pain-free. Their arthritis was gone. There have been other studies looking at if there's any difference between going to the gym and thinking about going to the gym. And with this study, they took a group of people and they sent half to the gym to work on their biceps. And the other half were allowed to sit in their armchairs and just think about going to the gym and working on their biceps. And they still recorded a very strong effect in the group who had just sat in their armchairs. The couch potatoes still built up their biceps. So the body really can't distinguish between you know, action and thought. And you see this most clearly with the placebo effect. Traditional Western medicine typically attributes spontaneous or miraculous healing to placebo. But what exactly is the placebo effect? The placebo effect is the, the fact that a belief that a person has can override their biology. Well, it's so profoundly important that science has recognized that at least one-third of all healings, including drugs and surgery and other allopathic interventions, one-third of all healings has nothing to do with the process, but has to do with the placebo effect. That a person believes that the process is going to heal them, and heals themselves in spite of the fact that maybe the pill was a sugar pill, or the operation was just a sham and wasn't real. And why this becomes important is, this is clearly one-third of all healings occurs without anybody doing anything other than having a positive thought. And what interests me as a biologist and, and former professor in a medical school is how we can talk about the placebo effect for about 15 minutes in a pharmacology course and then totally ignore the relevance of thought and mental processes on biology for the rest of medical education. So that our doctors are not really using the placebo effect effectively, that we're not even studying the placebo effect. And right now we could cut the health care cost by exactly one third by just using the placebo effect. It seems time that we began to shift the lens and start really focusing on what is the nature of the placebo. How is it that you can take an inert substance, something that has no known um, medicinal capacity, you know, potential, and that inert substance not only can create physiological changes in the body, but actually somehow is able to manage a whole cascade of responses within a very complex system such that it can target the liver or the kidney or the lungs, you know. That is a great mystery and we don't understand that and much more needs to be done. I would say that what medicine calls the placebo effect is, by all means, an effect that is created through energy fields. As we often say, one has to believe in it, then it will work. 
That is correct, yet we don't think about how we actually do that every day. If, for example, we want to watch RTL, a German TV station, then we press the RTL button, which means that we go into alignment with the frequency where RTL can be received. RTL is always present, but if we don't focus on it, then we won't receive it. So, when I want to watch RTL, I have to focus on it, I have to engage in it, and here it is the same. When I focus on something with my mind, the information follows this attention. The placebo effect is really another way of talking about the body's self-healing capacity, and anything that unleashes more of that is going to be a better system. I was absolutely desperate to have children. It was one of the reasons why I'd gotten divorced. I wanted children, my husband didn't. So I moved to London thinking it would take me a maximum of two years to find myself a, a new partner and settle down and I'd be out in the country having my 2.5 children and I'd be totally happy. That was my plan. I was very good at making plans. So there I was, I had my osteopathic practice, I was seeing clients and I was stressed, frustrated, depressed. And I had been having headaches for years, so maybe 10 years I'd been having these terrible headaches which were getting worse and worse and worse. Sometimes they lasted as long as five days. I had a routine visit with my doctor. And the doctor found um, that my hormone level was very much out of balance and immediately suspected that I had um, a, a tumor. So I was sent for a brain scan and they diagnosed a, a prolactinoma. It was a huge shock huge shock I, out of the blue and I felt at first how unfair uh, I went off to the medical library and started to learn everything I could about this tumor and when I discovered that it caused infertility I, I thought that is so ironic every cell in my body was saying I want children and I had somehow created a tumor that stopped me having children there had to be some reason for this. There had to be, you know, this was too much of a coincidence, I thought. And I got very curious. Because of my alternative medicine background, I decided to treat it alternatively, rather than go for the orthodox uh, drugs or surgery. Ariel decided to utilize neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP, to approach her tumor. So then I got into doing NLP at a much deeper level. Uh, got through the master practitioner level, came home, and was totally inspired as to what I could actually do. I started to really understand what NLP was all about. NLP is a practical form of psychology, which starts from where you are now and looks at where you want to be and uncovers what's in the way. If you have, like, my five-day headaches, you know, and you'd like to be without a tumor in your end state, the journey to, to get from square one to the end square is, you know, what we actually start exploring with NLP. Ariel made some very interesting discoveries as she began working with NLP. Now, remember, I was the person who thought every cell in her body wanted children. And what I discovered was that deep down, that going back to early, early, early childhood, I had such an abhorrence of what my family had been like, that the last thing in the world part of me wanted was to, to be a mother. And this really, really shocked me. I, th I thought I wanted one thing, and in fact, an unconscious part of me was going in a completely different direction. And when I understood the reasons why it didn't want children and what it was based on, I was able to kind of let go of that and and allow it to be the way it was and at least to understand why I'd created a life that didn't go down that path. 